A warm welcome to a new edition of the Max Planck Lectures on Fragile Ecosystems. Today we will be talking about the oceans, about the biomass in the oceans and the pattern behind it and how industrialized fishing has affected this balance in the oceans. We will listen to the biologist Ian Hatton of the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences in Leipzig and he will tell you about the secret law of nature that are being violated in the oceans. And after this lecture, we will discuss this, what it means, what is to be done about the secret laws and how maybe to restore well, the pristine biomass distribution. My name is Tanya Busse. I'm a journalist and author, and I write about the ecological transformation a lot. And this is why I'm so delighted to be your host today. My last book was on niche production, and there I found a paper on the global distribution of biomass on Earth, and there I learned that the global biomass of all farm animals is many times higher than the biomass of all the living wild animals in the world. And I was so struck by this fact. I was really surprised and shocked. And so this looks and tells a lot about the world we live in with kind of disbalances that we humans have created. So now Ian Hatton is going to tell us about the misbalance that we have created in the oceans. Let me introduce him to you. He is a biologist by training and for his PhD at McGill University, which is in Montreal in Canada, he was nominated for the national award. And since then, I feel like he has become a kind of global scientist. He has done research in Barcelona, in Princeton and in South Korea, in France, in the Czech Republic, in the US. And he has received a lot of awards for his work. He has also worked as a consultant in Indonesia in Mozambique and the Alexander van Humboldt Foundation has awarded Ian Hatton a Humboldt Research Fellowship. And this is why in January 2020 he joined the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences and started his study on the biological dynamics across the oceans. And this of course was again a global project. He worked together with a lot of scientists from all over the world, including Yinon Baron from Israel, who did the biomass survey on Earth that I've just mentioned before. So he has done a lot of calculations, a lot of measuring what is going on in the oceans. And this is what he is going to explain to us now. So over to you, Ian Hatton. Thank you very much for your time. And we are all looking forward to listen to yeah, what you are going to tell us about the biomass in the ocean and what means to this for us humans that have well, intermingled with this old pristine, pristine law of nature. Ian Hatton. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm in my office, but it's still a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. As Tanya mentioned, I'll be speaking about what is possibly life's largest scale pattern and how that has been fundamentally altered by human activity. So. I, before I begin, I just want to thank the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and the Max Planck Institute for um, Mathematics in the Sciences for supporting my research. It's been wonderful to work here. Okay, a quick overview. Um, I'm not sure if my slides are, are moving. They are. So Classic uh, overview, intro, methods, results, discussion. What's the size spectrum? A bit of background and history for the uninitiated. Uh, then our methods. We tried to reconstruct estimates for the total biomass of all marine life as it would have been 150 years ago, as well as up to the present day. Then our results, I'll show you what this pristine size spectrum looks like at the global scale. And finally, how humans have altered that balance, um, have altered that pattern. So the first thing we can say about life in the oceans is it's diverse, immensely, astonishingly, um, unfathomably diverse, like 2 million species that we know of, but estimates are that 90% remain unknown. So what are we to do? We've been classifying species for 250 years uh, and have only scratched the surface. 
Is there not some other way that we can understand life, some order in the fray? And the answer is body size. Body size simplifies everything. It's, it's easy to measure, you just weigh something. Uh, it's widely measured, but more importantly, it correlates to a, a, a great number of variables across the tree of life. The energy used, the rates of food intake, birth and death, range size, and a whole host of other rates and traits. So sorry for this slide. I know it's a lot to take in uh, at this hour of the, of the evening. Um, and, and so all I want you to do is kind of squint your eyes and make out the, the bold text. And what you'll see is that body size is on the x-axis in all of these plots, and it correlates quite well in some cases, quite not so well in other cases, to things as diverse as metabolism, consumption rates, uh, growth rates, mortality rates, as well as how a predator relates to its prey or how an offspring relates to its parent. And the point of all this is to say that body size takes this, this, this great um, blooming, buzzing diversity of life and collapses it into a single dimension that can tell us a great deal about everything else. I should say that all of these patterns go from bacteria to whales, and some of them, particularly metabolism and growth, are widely thought to be among the most universal relations in biology. In fact, I would argue that this growth law at the bottom left there is truly the most universal relation we know of in biology and possibly underpinning the scaling laws, uh, the other scaling laws that are shown here and elsewhere. But um, that's a story for another day. In this talk, we're going to kind of look at a higher level of organization at a larger scale. Um, these are all physiological processes or how one individual relates to another kind of at the individual level. We're going to look at the whole ocean biomass. But before we do, we should get some perspective on what it means to say from bacteria to whales. So what is 23 orders of magnitude really? Well, the ratio of a small bacterium to a blue whale is the same as the ratio of, say, you to the mass of, what do you think? It's not the mass of all human inhabitants, that's about 10 orders of magnitude. And it's not the mass of all the water, say, in the oceans, that's about 19 or 20 orders of magnitude. It's the mass of the earth, the entire earth down to its molten core. So now that we know what bacteria to whales are, we can ask what is this, this size spectrum? It's sometimes called the Sheldon spectrum, the biomass spectrum, the normalized numerical abundance spectrum. There's lots of different names, it doesn't matter. But the story starts a little over 50 years ago when Ray Sheldon and his colleagues boarded a research vessel and began hauling buckets of water out of the ocean and passing it through this instrument called a Coulter counter, which counts the size and the number of different particles, mostly small plankton. This led to a magnificent paper, I would say, now uh, 50 years old. You can see the date up there in the top corner, 1972, I think. And they hypothesized that to a first approximation, roughly equal concentrations of material occur at all particle sizes within the range from bacteria to whales. So how did they come to this crazy, bold hypothesis? Well, they undertook, um, they circumnavigated the Americas, and at each point there on the map, they took out a bucket of water, passed it through the Coulter counter, and put, put together these plots. Each plot is connected to a point. So let's unpack what these plots really are. On the x-axis, we've got uh, body size, but the axis is funny, it's logarithmic. It goes 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It could also be 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Um, as long as the x-axis and the y-axis are the same factor, then that won't change the shape of this distribution. Um, notice that on log axes, 
the small size classes are actually small. They're, they're, the, the interval from one to two is smaller than the interval from eight to 16. Um, but even though they're smaller in their size range, the things that fall into those, there's actually more of them. And so um, if we count the numbers of things that fall in each size class, as we pass the water through this, this instrument, we tend to find that um, for every doubling in the size class, there's half the number of individuals, more or less. So these axes are inverse, th this relationship is inverse to one another. Now, uh, I hope you're, you're still with me. Um, we're, we're getting there to what he actually plotted. If you multiply now count times size, so let's say I had 10 individuals, each 10 kilograms, I have 100 kilograms of biomass. And so multiplying the X and Y axis, count times size gives us a fairly even distribution of biomass across this size spectrum. And so that's what Sheldon was plotting and his colleagues in, in those plots that I showed. And, and so based on these measurements, they made a, a very big, very bold hypothesis that this pattern could extend all the way out to whales. Um, they, at the time, they just made very cursory estimates of other groups in localized regions and drew roughly with a, you know, thick black marker where those groups might fall. But a thick black marker, you know, 50 years later doesn't cut it. Um, and so for 50 years, this hypothesis has stood, it's not been refuted, but then neither was it ever formally tested. And that's because it's pretty hard to do. Different groups like phytoplankton, zooplankton, whales, require very different estimation methods. And you can imagine whales, some of them swim over the entire ocean, entire ocean basins. So the only scale at which this hypothesis can be tested is the entire ocean. Now, not only that, but we would want to quantify all ocean biomass in the absence of human interference. And that's very hard. But that's what we set out to do. So Ryan Hennigan on the left and I were postdocs in Eric Galbraith's lab in Barcelona when we first had the idea to, to take this on uh, some three and a half years ago now. Ryan undertook a lot of the heavy lifting as far as the data and statistical analysis. And um, in the same year, Yinan Baran had published a paper that uh, Tanya referred to at the beginning that estimated the global biomass of everything on Earth. And so he joined us to help us locate data and undertake sort of you know, sanity checks on our estimates. And I should just say that if any of you watching ever get the opportunity to work with these guys, you should jump at the opportunity. It was a real pleasure to work with them. I should also uh, thank a number of people that helped us in, in really valuable discussions along the way. So if any of, of you are watching uh, with your names up there, thanks again. So here's what we did. This is just sort of like, um, you know, a, a rough overview of, of our, our methods. And again, I just want to stress that to estimate pristine biomass before industrialized fishing and whaling, we needed to make certain simplifying assumptions. We considered only direct impacts rather than indirect impacts like habitat modification or, or changes in uh, feeding relationships and so on. Um, and so we assumed that bacteria and various plankton groups remained pretty much unchanged over these past 150 years. Uh, for bacteria, we used 50,000 water samples and then correlated those to environmental variables so we could interpolate over the ocean. For phytoplankton, we used satellite imagery of chlorophyll along with empirical equations to convert chlorophyll to biomass. For the zooplankton groups, we used uh, 200,000 water samples and undertook similar methods uh, for bacteria. I, I hope you're still with me. Um, I know this is tedious, but stick with me. It, it, it gets better. This is just a bit more on methods. But for fish, 
This is where it gets difficult now. Fish migrate over vast distances. They school, they actively escape capture. You need a very large net to get a representative sample. And so um, to do this, we used two independent process models constrained by harvest data, but constrained by, by catch data. Um, and these models do a pretty good job of estimating biomass today. They are in line with data from the literature. And so we projected them back to 1850. Both models give, gave similar biomass, and so we took a mean. And finally, for mammals, uh, we used species-specific global surveys for the majority of the hundred and some odd um, marine mammal species. Most of that data was taken from IUCN. We also supplemented that with data from 250 uh, some published sources. And many of those were actually reconstructions of pristine biomass. So, so that made our life a bit easier. So those are the methods. Uh, I know it's tedious, but hmm, you don't know the half of it. So here is the distribution of our samples globally. And um, along with, you know, um, process models, satellite imagery, species specific surveys, we we constructed or we estimated the, the total biomass at each one degree lat long region of the ocean. And then finally, uh, we partitioned that biomass in each major group into different size classes. And this is what we got. This is the global ocean size spectrum uh, from bacteria to whales as best we could estimate. And it, it looks quite consistent across um, across the, the size spectrum. Um, and we were quite amazed when we saw this. I feel like I should just pause and let you marvel at its beauty. It's uh, not the plot, but the fact that this pattern exists in nature is, is quite remarkable. I, I've certainly never seen anything like this in ecology. Um, now, you know, you could say, well, this pattern has been known for 50 years, and in some senses that's true. But up until late last year, there was not a single entry on Wikipedia about the size spectrum, the biomass spectrum. I searched everything I could, nothing. And so here we have the largest encyclopedia on Earth that doesn't even mention what is the largest scale pattern in nature, as far as we can tell. Okay, so the slope is very near minus one, which is what we'd expect. Count is inverse to size. And so when we multiply count and size, we obtain a fairly even distribution of biomass. Um, I'll just describe a little bit more about what this plot includes. Um, we're also going down to the depth of the ocean. So the hatched bars, the, the striped bars are down to the seafloor, and uh, we don't have as much confidence in, in that data. There's a lot less estimates of, of biomass at that depth. Um, we're more confident in the solid bars, which show the upper sunlit 200 meters of the ocean, and that's where the vast majority of the diversity of marine life exists. And indeed, it looks quite even across the size spectrum. There's about one gigaton of biomass in each one order of magnitude size class. Um, you should also note that we have very large error bars. Those are um, sort of multiplicative or logarithmic 95% confidence intervals. Um, and there are two notable exceptions. You can probably see that bacteria at the far on the far left are, and cyanobacteria, they're, they're also photosynthesizers, are elevated above the rest, above that one gigaton. And large mammals, particularly whales, are depressed below that. Um, and remember, that's not because of whaling. We already tried to account for that. We've already, this is the pristine biomass spectrum before the, before the advent of major whaling activity. But nonetheless, it certainly appears that Sheldon et al, we're right, there's a fairly even distribution of biomass from bacteria to whales, except for bacteria and whales. 
Okay, so where might this pattern originate? Why is biomass so evenly distributed across logarithmic size classes? It's certainly not evenly distributed across regular linear size classes, one, two, three, four, five. Um, it's only at, at, on a log scale where this pattern can become uh, clear. And not surprisingly, ecologists have studied this for a long time. Um, and the theories they've come up with could maybe schematically be classified into to two categories, two classes. There's a kind of energetic uh, explanations and there's dynamic explanations. On the one hand, we know in marine life, big eats small. So uh, usually bigger things eat smaller things and not vice versa. So energy tends to transfer up the size spectrum from small to large sequentially, and it's replaced by um, sunlight coming into phytoplankton, which are usually very small. Cyanobacteria are small, and most, uh, most photosynthesizers are small. And so energy is replaced at the small end of the spectrum. On the other hand, um, we could think of growth as also transferring organisms from small to large. That's what growth is and it's replaced by reproduction. And so the balance of, of these kind of processes is what's thought to underlie the size spectrum. Not only that, uh, all of these energetic and dynamic processes are closely linked to body size, as I showed earlier. So here's that squint your eyes plot again. And, um, and the, on the top are kind of energetic variables often used in size spectrum theory, energy use, uh, acquisition, and from where you're getting that as a predator, where in the size spectrum you're obtaining that energy. And on the bottom, we have growth and death. Uh, we have the offspring mass, how small are the, um, how small are the, the, the individuals replacing those that grow through the size spectrum. But is this really what's underpinning the size spectrum? Is this where it originates? Is, is in some combination of these scaling laws? Um, for one thing, the size spectrum is a, a pattern at a much higher scale of organization. Um, it's also potentially much more regular and consistent than many of these patterns presumed to be its cause. And if I may, I'll just, uh, I'll just go through one example uh, and consider metabolism because metabolism features in uh, many of si many size spectrum theories. And for decades, it's been assumed to scale with body size near three quarters, which is certainly true in some major groups like mammals and birds and, and other groups. But when we go from bacteria to whales, that slope is quite a bit elevated, 0 0.9 in marine systems, maybe even higher in terrestrial. And so uh, the theories that were previously plugging in three quarters along with other scaling laws and coming up with the number minus one for the size spectrum, when you plug in 0.9, doesn't work. Or at least you need other things that have to be modified in order for it to work. And, and some theories predict steeper size spectrum slopes, minus 1.2, Others predict shallower slopes, minus 0 0.8. And that's just metabolism. If we went through other uh, scaling laws, we would come up with similar difficulties potentially in going from bacteria to whales. Um, another aspect to kind of considering the origin of this pattern is, and this is maybe a bit more philosophical, but what I've shown you is a very general kind of pattern. It's called a power law size distribution in other fields, or maybe called Zipf's law, which means it has a, uh, a rank frequency or a rank size distribution with a slope near minus one. And so this is a common pattern that's observed over and over again. Um, on the left, this is some work I've been collaborating on over for four and a half years now, we're, we're trying to build a size distribution for the 36 trillion cells in, in our body. And the work is not yet published, but that's a sneak peek of, of what that distribution 
uh, might look like. We see a slope of about minus 0.98. And so we can say that the cells in your body exhibit a very similar pattern to the bodies in the ocean. Um, and there are many more examples. The cities in the world exhibit a similar pattern from cities, say, of 50,000 people up to Tokyo. And so, you know, and it co goes on, the wealth distribution follows this pattern. So there's only kind of one Elon Musk or a few very, very rich people. And there's lots of poor people like myself, and there's lots, lots more very poor people. Um, and so this pattern in the wealth distribution has been known for a very long time. But even more recently, um, asteroids in our solar system also follow this pattern. So the point of all of this is just to say that it's a general kind of pattern. And to think that it's underpinned by specifically biological factors is, um, you know, we could question. I don't even know if it's potentially physical, statistical. And I don't think anybody has a good explanation for the generality of this pattern. But that doesn't mean we can't ask how this pattern has been modified by human activities. And so a bit more methods. Um, and I'll try to, this is, I'll just go quickly through this, but we, we used global syntheses of fish loss from stock assessments and ecosystem models already published um, to try to assess uh, how fishing has impacted this pattern. And as well as um, we tried to project how this pattern might change up to 2100 due to projected changes in climate from using um, published impacts of climate change on different taxa. Um, so we've known that, uh, that fishing has increased dramatically, possibly fourfold over the past 50 years. And, and it's valuable to put this in the context of the impact this has had on different size classes. So using, um, these are our best estimates drawing on prior published syntheses of how fishing has impacted different size classes. And it's compared, so I don't know if you can see that, um, and I can't see if you're shaking your head no, but there, the, um, you can see the, the stripe bars are fishing up to the present, the cumulative impact of fishing over the past 150 or so years. Whereas the climate projections are the sort of gray pink solid bars. And those are under uh, an RCP 8.5 climate scenario, which is a pretty extreme climate scenario taken to 2100. And so you can see right away that the cumulative impact of fishing is it far, far exceeds um, even a, an extreme climate scenario going to 2100. The effect that the, the fishing and whaling has had on the size spectrum is to change something that looked like this in a pristine state to something that now looks like this. We've essentially truncated, we've lopped off the, the, this portion of the spectrum that we care about the most. That's the stuff that we, we uh, admire or we eat. And so uh, to briefly summarize all we've said, and let's see if, ah, wonderful. We've, we basically, we took water sample estimates, satellite imagery, process models, global species surveys, and a variety of other data sources to estimate the global distribution of biomass density which we then partitioned into size classes of five major groups. And based on that, we constructed the pristine uh, 18, pre-1850 biomass spectrum, which we found to be surprisingly even. But compared to today, fishing and whaling have significantly impacted larger size classes and altered one of life's largest scale patterns. So a minute to summarize three and a half years of work um, thanks to the press team here at the Institute for, for this nice summary. So what are the implications of all this? Um, have humans simply sort of inserted ourselves into the food chain and now play the same role as what we've cumulatively removed over the past two centuries? Have humans simply replaced the top predator? 
Um, qualitatively, yes, we are now the top predator. We're at the top of the food chain. But quantitatively, uh, we play a very different role. Energetically, we play a very different role. So we can estimate the, the energy respired by that, um, by that biomass that's been lost, the pink uh, hatched region of the plot. We can estimate how much energy would have been respired by that group. And that comes out to about 10 gigatons per year. When we compare that to the energy gained through, through fishing, it amounts to only about 0.1 gigaton per year. So in other words, about 90% of energy flow to top predators has been lost. And so um, that's, I think, where I can conclude. Uh, and I think we can conclude by saying human activities, and this is kind of repetitive at this point, have altered one of life's largest scale patterns. We don't know all the implications except massive changes to energy flow. And I think that the origin of this pattern, understanding where this comes from, will help us to understand the impacts that these changes uh, have had. You know, the impact on ecosystem productivity, on ecosystem functioning, fragility, resilience, and other things like that. So that's all I've got. I'm happy to take any questions. Wow. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you for taking us on this journey and telling us about the beauty of this pattern that you have found. Sometimes for for scientists, they see beauty where other people see lines and, and bars. <laughs> and, and what we appreciate is the kind of beauty that you have discovered. And I hope everybody who is watching enjoyed the lecture as much as I did and I invite you all to send us your questions and I suggest we all start with kind of um, understand questions of understanding then we too discuss a bit the question of where does this pattern come from where is the origin of this pattern and then we sum up and take other questions so please send us your questions in 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 the in the chat below the video where you're seeing us right now and i do have uh, a few questions of understanding then i come back to to our search for the origin of the pattern that you have described the first um, question that reached us during your talk was the question that how how did you deal with the imbalance of sampling spots more in the north than in the south it is set here or at least that is how the it looked in the map that you have showed and exactly i've seen more sampling spots close to the coast and less in the in the middle of the ocean so absolutely you... that's a great question um and that was something we spent a bit of time trying to to figure out how best to deal with that there's certainly far far more samples in the north than in the southern ocean um so what we what we did was then to correlate the the biomass. We built generalized linear models that correlated the the sample estimate with other environmental variables. And so these include chlorophyll, they include temperature, they include um, salinity, they include depth. And and based on these estimates, then we could because those estimates are global we know the bathymetry we know the chlorophyll from satellite imagery we know the um we know the temperature globally and so by knowing uh these kind of global environmental correlates we could we could then interpolate through all the other points i don't know i hope that answers that question yeah, I think so. To me, it does. Although I couldn't uh, follow, maybe making my, the calculations on my own, <laughs> I'd need to ask you. But I think it's it's a uh, it's a question of adding and giving way to to the samples. Then, um, exactly. the next, yeah, yeah. okay. Sure. Then, Okay, um, the next question was, how does the biomass distribution look like if you group it according to the food chain? Is it still a pyramid? Um, could you answer this? I'm not sure because I've learned there's more like a food web, not really a chain, which might be a too simple model or does it work out? Does it change the pattern? That's a that's a great question, too. It's it's a bit hard to answer. On one hand, the ocean is not a, a discrete chain. Um, there's lots of omnivory. So that means that something 
is eating things that are both um, that are both animals and plants potentially. But then even above that, you know, piscivores are eating planktivores. They're eating um, they're eating other piscivores. So you've got fish up there that are eating even their own offspring sometimes. So cannibalism, which is completely not uh, not a, a discrete chain. There's lots of omnivory, but the thing about the oceans is that um, that what, like I said, big eats small. So this distribution, this even distribution of biomass can kind of be turned on its side and you would get a, a bit of a sense of what the trophic pyramid would look like because mm -hmm. big things eat small things and they tend to do so sort of multiplicatively. Um, but it's a very difficult question to answer. You know, it requires and it requires models and, and everything else. And, and so we don't have a good answer for that. I obviously don't have a good answer for it, but even I don't think um, the best ecologists would have a, a good answer for that. Mm -hmm. And even there, maybe there is not a global pattern, but today we stick to this question, where does this global pattern of size distribution come from, which is, to me, is complicated enough, I think. And we have a third question that leads us to this question of origin. Um, and the question goes, are there similar powers, uh, power laws for single ecosystems, life on land or life on the whole earth, maybe? So you have been calculating all these samples of the ocean, but your colleague in Israel, he has had a look on biomass on Earth. Um, are there parallels? Yeah, that's a great question too. And it's a bit more difficult to answer because what do we do with trees? And trees are really the, the thing that, that make it difficult. Trees obviously have a big body size, but is that it's most of it's not metabolically active. The trunk is is pretty inert material for the most part, and we have a lot of them. There's a lot of trees. So if you did public, if you did um, plot it for everything on land, you'd see a bump where the trees exist. Now, if you took out the wood, that would both diminish the body size and the biomass quite extensively, and that's something that. Um, we haven't looked into. Um, there are other patterns of this sort in specific ecosystems. So soils, they found the same pattern in soils when they just look at the microorganisms and the worms that live in soils. Uh, and of course, this pattern was first observed in particular ecosystems. And that was where the notion that it might be global came from. Um, Sheldon and his colleagues were originally looking in specific regions of the ocean. And so there is, there is good evidence, but you know, if we looked at trees, I've looked at trees alone, just looking at trees and they don't really follow this distribution. So they're a big question. Um, they're obviously a major part of the, the land biomass, the most major part by far. And so it's hard to, to know how to treat them. I maybe, guess that's maybe. my answer. <laughs> okay. So maybe the trees are playing the role of the whales that are kind of um, disrupting the pattern, a very even um, line that you have found out in your pattern. Mm -hmm. So I was, when I first learned about your findings, I thought it is a, quite obviously the relationship between prey and predators. Of course, the big animals eat more like one wolf eats a lot of mice. It sounds to, sounded to me so easy to find the origin of this pattern in the relationship between predators and prey. And now I have heard that you say, no, this is way too easy and the pattern is there. Um, and you find it even in, in, the, in the distribution of stars in the universe. So um, could you could you said okay we don't know where the pattern originates from but what what is your guess what is it if it's not caused alone by biological implications? Um, it might be caused by biological implications and it might be a different set. It's possible that it's coincidence that it exists in these different um, you know asteroids and and wealth and things like that. But it's also possible that it's, it has something of the same flavor as, say, the normal distribution, um, which we see in, in lots of different 
scenarios, it's you know based on the say the central limit theorem or something. Um, but it, we see it in uh, we see it in lots of different contexts, and and it has nothing to do with the specific details of that context. Um, the same with sort of exponential growth. We see it in finance. We maybe see it in biology. And it doesn't have anything to do with the specific biological factors or the specific financial factors um, necessarily. So uh, it, it, it's possible that it has a similar kind of flavor to that. Now, the normal distribution is interesting just because we tend to think of size distributions as being normally distributed. That's how we first learn about it. What's the size of everyone in this room? Well, there's only one of us. but everybody watching say what's the size distribution of everybody here um, and that would be kind of a normal distribution exactly the same methods as we're using uh, you'd get a normal distribution for just the people but when you expand out to the ocean then you get this other pattern and so it's possible that it, it, it's some kind of um, central limit theorem for multiplicative uh, processes or something but i i couldn't tell you uh, we don't know. We just we we at this point we don't know. We we've suspected this pattern exists globally, and um, and we're still in the process of. That was one of the major motivations for me to come to the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences was to explore this pattern here with colleagues, and um, and we haven't uh, cracked it as yet. So. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a good answer as to where it comes from. But where does the research go? First, first, just to understand what you said, normal distribution is that what the met mathematician Gauss found out, this curve that says in the middle, all the normal people are, then they are few, quite small, and other few are quite large. And you always find this kind of form uh, whenever you talk about uh, distribution, right? And so when exactly. you look at the oceans, you have this, this other form that forms a line and you see the same kind of pattern behind it, secret pattern. Can you more, I've heard that you said it's a beauty that you see. Can you explain the moment when you find out really that what uh, Sheldon's idea was and you could prove it and you saw this, this even line saying, wow, there is something. Can you tell us about the moment when you were all looking at this pattern and saying, oh, we have found the secret law of nature, but we don't know what it means. What was it like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's a, a secret law of nature, but um, more generally, this this sort of Zips law that arises in all these different contexts could well be a sort of law of nature that I'm not sure we've yet cracked. Um, but when we saw that pattern uh, for the first time, we sort of gathered around and, and were pretty struck by just how regular it was. We, we weren't expecting anything of that sort. Um, we were expecting it to hold, frankly. I mean, we wouldn't have undertook this research if we didn't think that it had the pretty strong potential to hold. Um, Sheldon had already shown it with a thick black marker, and so we just wanted to kind of clarify that. But when we saw just how regular it was and, and how consistent it was, we were pretty struck, there's no question. Um, but uh yeah you know we also had to kind of remain agnostic to it so that we wouldn't um we wanted to we we definitely went back and checked it like a hundred times to make sure we weren't um you know that this wasn't uh some artifact or something like that because it certainly looks like an artifact i've never seen anything like that in ecology what we tend to see in ecology is uh like paintball where you shoot uh you know and it splatters all over the screen and you put a line through it and say look there's a regression that's what most of ecology looks like at that scale and yet here we have something that's that's very regular and consistent suggesting that there's somehow order in um in you know um in this the diversity of life in this blooming buzzing confusion that there is this kind of order and so i think that's kind of where the beauty part comes from it's a it's a beautiful relationship it's so simple um i think it's still so un misunderstood that um it's a it's a very compelling area of science right now i would say 
It is. To me, this sounds like a secret law, but maybe that's not a very precise scientific expression. But I do have a precise question that goes, is there any theoretical model as yet coming close to explaining the minus 1.04 exponent? Or could the combination of several processes like metabolism, etc., with different exponents account for the exponent of minus 1.05. Maybe you have to explain this exponent before to me and other non-mathematical um, followers of yours before, and then give us clues about the model that might be behind it. Right. So the, the, the minus 1.04 is the exponent, and that's just the slope of the line on, on log log axes. And that's when you represent it in one particular way. You could represent it as a probability distribution, and then the slope, the, the exponent would be minus two. You could represent it as um, a cumulative distribution function, and then the slope is minus one. You could represent it as biomass, as we have done as well, and then the slope is zero. There's even more ways to represent it, and they've all been used, and it makes the literature extremely difficult to navigate because you never know which exponent they're referring to. Um, but I've just been calling it minus one or zero in the case of the biomass spectrum. Minus one slope between uh, something and something else means they're inversely related. So it's like uh, y is one over x. That's y is equal to x to the power minus one. They're the same thing. Um, and so this inverse relationship, that's what translates into that even biomass distribution. Now, it's very possible that there is some combination of, um, of physiological scaling laws like metabolism, like growth, that combine in such a way as to give rise to this, um, this size spectrum. And in fact, we know that the size spectrum has to be related to uh, many of these uh, lower level scaling laws because it's all the same organisms. It's, it's, they're either represented in, in this plot over here or they're represented in this plot over here, but it's the same organisms taking part in both plots. So they have to be connected to each other. But, um, but it's not clear what that theory would be uh, in my mind, especially when you consider that when you actually look from bacteria to whales, um, the scaling exponents of these, the slopes of these different body size relations uh, are modified for, for most of them, for metabolism and consumption, um, they're modified significantly. Um, for growth, in fact, they're not, and um, that's another kind of topic that, that is, I think is very interesting. But um, uh, we don't, I, I would say we don't have a good theory. There are theories out there. We could, you know, uh, on another day, we could kind of go through those. But um, I, I think that's kind of maybe too much detail um, to, to at this point. Okay, so we, we, we will wait for another paper of yours, another way of, another lecture that explains us so, so, so good to understand for non-statistics, uh, as a statistics scientist. Um, I would like to come back to Zip's law. You mentioned it, and then I found out Zip was a linguistic scientist who calculated the length and the appearance, the probability of words in texts. And I was surprised that Zip's law, looking at words in, in books, has something to do with um, the biomass distribution in the oceans. Can you explain this? I mean, it's, you actually found the same pattern in the books than in the oceans. That's what you're saying. Um, yeah, I, I, okay. So yes, you're correct that uh, Zip um, was a linguist. And I think in the 1940s, he published a book about the distribution of words in text. So the number of times the word the appears is, is very, very frequent. And then the next frequent word is maybe of, and it's about half as frequent as the word the. And then the next word is and, and it's about, you know, maybe half as frequent as the one previous. And this pattern somehow carries on. 
And, and so he found that the rank frequency distribution of words in texts follows this pattern. He also described several other patterns. Um, but what the slope of that line was, was minus one. And so it's kind of become known as Zipp's law, but it's not really well defined uh, whether Zipp's law includes just the general power law relation or whether it, it describes the specific exponent. Um, but most, I think many people consider Zipp's law to be a minus one power law, a minus one power law distribution. We're plotting it a little bit differently than the way he did. We, um, we can't really compute the rank of every individual in the ocean. There's, uh, you know, 23 orders of magnitude. It's, it's simply impossible to do that. We have no idea um, about how we might do that. But you could think of it as being essentially the same. There are ways to think about this. I mean, they're slightly different. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of waffling. It's a, it's a thing we've discussed here at the Institute with you know, mathematicians and physicists that are far more capable of me and we still get kind of confused or not necessarily confused, but it's, I can tell you that the, the patterns are the same but they're represented in such different ways that it's confusing to think about them as being the same. On one hand, you know, he, he plotted rank on the x-axis and um, frequency on the y-axis. We're sort of uh, flipping that around. Um, anyway, the point is, is that uh, they're essentially the same pattern. And when it's seen that it exists amongst um, distributions of wealth, that it just it describes distributions of asteroid size and other things, then you can see that this minus one exponent appears over and over again uh, in nature. Okay, so we have um, kind of the ecological sciences that tell us that everything is entangled and connected in a web of life and that there are relationships between everything. And then you come up and saying there's a global pattern that is you find it in the stars in the universe, you find it in words in a book and you find it with fish and bacteria and whales in the ocean. This is to me, it sounds really surprising. But I would like to talk about the implications because you we're not only talking about the pristine scale pattern that was in the oceans before humans started to alter everything, but also um, about the changes that ha have come up uh, in the last, during the last century and, well, the human activity. Um, but before we talk on, on what we did, there is a question concerning mass extinction events. And apart from the mass extinction event that we humans are currently uh, causing um, the last one was like I think 66 million years ago but of course there have been tremendous changes in the life in the biomass what do you think um, what was the, the the effect of this are there smaller organisms more maybe robust to substantial changes in the global environment did they survive or do we know anything whether this pattern was disturbed by the mass extinction events I, I really would not be able to tell you that with much certainty. Um, it, it appears that this pattern has been in existence for a long time. Um, I imagine it existed, although, you know, whales are, are fairly new arrivals on the scene evolutionarily. So obviously it wouldn't have existed um, prehistoric, very, very prehistoric. But um, certainly, I, I think that um, mass extinction events can definitely have wider um, effects than the, the, the species that are, part, that are um, specifically impacted. Um, it is a web, it's all connected, and so there's certainly going to be ramifications that run through that food web um, in, in complex and probably unpredictable ways. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. So my, uh, the, my collaborator, Eric Galbraith, is currently trying to estimate um, sort of a size spectrum prehistorically based on fish teeth, uh, shark teeth in particular, and some other uh, indicators that might have 
suggested a quite different distribution, but it's very difficult to, to get at that data. I mean, it was difficult enough to get at the current size spectrum as is, exists today, going back in time, you know, more than 150 years, going back many thousands, tens of thousands is, is I would say, beyond the realm of speculation that, that I'm willing to undertake at least. Hmm. Yeah, sure. And unfortunately, we don't have any satellite data from the time to tell us about the chlorophyll bacteria producing um, bacteria in the ocean. There is another question concerning this, uh, um, the changing of, of, of biomass this is, uh, that goes, who decides what balance means? The oceans have made um, many, have had many makeups and why is the current one the right? So this brings us back to the question that we have kind of created a misbalance. So what is the right balance? What would you say? That's a great question. I, I think the title of this talk was sort of a little bit of a play on words where, you know, balance often indicates uh, evenness or something like that. And we're seeing a sort of evenness in this distribution um, pre-industrialization. And then that, that evenness is somehow uh, modified, altered, so that it's no longer kind of balanced. And so I think that that's sort of the origin of that, uh, that title. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that we have, that's a kind of philosophical question perhaps that, you know, who, who decides what is a balanced ecosystem? Um, and we don't yet know where this pattern comes from. We don't know what its implications are. We don't know what the effects of changing energy flow through the system might have. And so maybe there are none. And in which case, does it even matter? Um, but we also know that many ecosystems, there are tipping points in which, you know, if you push the system too far, everything looks fine up until a point, and then there could be catastrophe. And we don't know where that point lies. And so we're playing with, um, you know, we're, we're skating on thin ice, uh, as it were, if we continue to, to do that. No, exactly. That was going to be my next question, because we have seen in the Baltic Sea, we have already seen these tipping points and regime shifts where too much warm water, a lack of, of water exchange from the ocean, and also too much fishing has caused these dead zones with nearly zero oxygen anymore. So there has been this tipping point um, for quite large area in the Baltic Sea. So do, are we in kind of, and, and then knowing that the oceans produce a lot of energy of oxygen that we need as humans, could this mean we're confronting these regime shifts on a larger scale? Um, is there anything you can, can tell us by your research? Or is it just, as you said, you're still looking for, for the answers? I, I think we are definitely still looking for the answers, but, you know, we're seeing that that uh, a global pattern has been significantly altered and it's it's a major change in the flow of energy. We don't know uh, where that energy is necessarily going at this point and, and what the consequences of that could be. Um, you know, it's one thing to study a particular system and get to know it, but when we're looking at this very large scale uh, globally, it, it's a much more difficult um thing to make predictions about um but i agree with you you know when you do look at these specific systems there are many indications that they are they can be fragile they often seem to be very robust up until a point and at that and then once that's exceeded then then they can um they can be altered significantly and have all sorts of other impacts um, and, uh, you know, a lot of times that can come about from internal dynamics and not necessarily just an external driver that keeps on pushing it, but uh, an external driver that pushes it up to a point where the internal dynamics change and then there's no saving it. Even if you kind of pull away, uh, it's, it's possible that it's too late. So those are concerns. There's no question, um, but they're, they're difficult things to have clear you know, policy implications or political action in order to, um, to avert. 
So this means we could be on a point of no return and then we add climate change to this um, and, and listen to scientists who say the fish go up north because the water is getting hot, warmer. And then we have predictions that the coral reefs are uh, about to implode. And this means even further, further changes in the ocean systems, right? Yes, yes, for sure. There are definitely um, there are definitely predictions that suggest uh, there could be significant changes. Um, coral reefs are very sensitive. We've, we we know that for sure. Um, other parts of the ecosystem are maybe uh, are maybe more robust, but it's difficult to say what kind of changes will will come about um, with with climate warming. Um, and uh, changes in, in salinity and things of that sort. Um, I'm not an expert on, uh, you know, my collaborator, Eric Galbraith, knows quite a bit more about climate change, and he's certainly very concerned about uh, the effects on the ocean. Um, but um, predictions are hard, are hard to make, especially about the future. So. <laughs> Okay, I know. I, I know. We're talking about complex systems. You have discovered a pattern that seems to be something like a, a classical pattern of nature that you have discovered, and then there come these millions of, of of implications that make it nearly impossible to predict anything. Okay, precise. But uh, would you? How would you say? What what kind of future research do we need to understand what it means if we humans have created a misbalance in the oceans? Um, is there, would you say, I need these kinds of, of, of scientists of the Max Planck uh, Gesellschaft or wherever they are <laughs> doing their work, uh, w w what are the, the, the further, further questions to be solved and the next research that has to be done? That's, yeah, excellent question. Um, I, I would think that understanding the origin of this pattern would help to understand what alterations to it might imply. Um, and that means, you know, understanding also the um, the existing sort of uh, imbalances in bacteria and in whales. Why are bacteria elevated? Why are whales depressed from the um, pristine pattern? And uh, we still don't understand that. We don't understand where the energy that's that's been lost from the system, the, the energy respired. Uh, maybe going. Um, and so there are a number of questions that are specific to the size spectrum that we don't yet understand. It would also be nice to understand how uh, the size spectrum changes in different regions of the ocean, but a sort of global meta analysis that can correlate different environmental factors to, um, to changes in the spectrum. Does warming alter the shape or alter this distribution in some way? Um, what, how resilient is the system if fishing is removed? So do we see differences in protected areas versus heavily fished areas in the shape of the spectrum? Obviously, we can't do that at the global scale, but we can do that uh, at a smaller scale that could offer insight into the global scale. So I, I think those are questions that are definitely um, key uh, going forward, and I hope that um, that that scientists will will undertake them. Mm -hmm. That means mathematicians and biologists, ecologists, etc., working together. I do have a last question for you, and that is, like a few months ago, I talked to the historian Deepesh Chakrabarti, the Indian historian who introduced the kind of planetary age to history, and he said, now in the moment where humans are altering. Um, the the uh, or, or where humans have led us into the age of the Anthropocene, altering um, the, the the ways of nature um, and, and altering natural systems in uh, that have consequences for a long, long time, longer than human history is. Um, we need to take a look at this planetary age. And then I, I learned about your biography that was kind of circling the, the globe and doing research at all these different places, always working together with scientists all over the world and doing 
research on this global database. Uh, how do you how do you look at this science doing science in a planetary age where humans change the the ways nature go for for centuries to come and thousands and ten thousands of years? Do you feel like a planetary scientist? Well, it's uh, it's certainly you know we're collaborating now at a in a much easier fashion than we used to be able to. Um, now we can speak like we are now over Zoom. I'm sitting in my office comfortably here in Leipzig, and um, you know so that that's one aspect that that makes collaboration much easier. Um, but at the same time, there's something lost with that. I think that when when it's become more difficult to travel or when we're not in a room face to face, there's lot, kind of less interaction that goes on. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, those are those are very broad, big views. And I certainly um, I, I, I'm, I'm drawn to that. But uh, that's a that's a tough question. So um yeah i don't know <laughs> i don't know how to answer that i mean it's 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 amazing i mean for me it's like it's like feeling where we have changed so many things even these secret laws or these global patterns and makes me feel we should feel maybe more humble to 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 be more respectful to nature to stop further alterations because there have been there are so many things that we have already changed i know you're a scientist you're not a policy advisor but um if taking taking the chance that we are not beyond the the points of no return what has to be done to go back to this pattern do you think we should stop fishing to to try to come back to this pit, pristine pet, pristine pattern or is it um is it anything we can do to come back to this old balance that you have found um, that exists in the oceans yeah that's a great question and i think you you nailed it when when you indicated you know we ought to be uh, humbled by by some of this this order that exists. You know that there are these patterns that exist. Uh, what does it mean? It's certainly larger than we are. It's larger than life in a sense. And um, and so, how are we supposed to uh, how are we supposed to kind of return to that balance? Um, and and that's very very difficult to to answer. Um, but I think it, it does require some amount of humility and 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 with that comes also um, being cautious as to what we do to solve the problem, not only um, what we can do to um, slow down the advent, the, the continuity of the problem, but also to be careful what we do when we try to solve a problem, because so many of our um, solutions end up causing further problems in their stead. And so, um, but these are such big problems. I don't even know if this is, I wouldn't say this is the biggest problem facing us right now. And you look at the state of the world, there are certainly very many other problems that deserve our attention. Um, and so where do we begin? Um, but yeah, it, it sort of requires maybe a mental shift as opposed to direct policy action. Um. <laughs> wow. Okay. I think by your research and by telling us about the beauty of the pattern that you have found of in the size balance in the oceans, maybe you started preparing, paving the way for the mental shift that we do need. And of course, I do re agree that first the, this horrible war in Ukraine has to be stopped and then we start stopping all the other problems that we have caused, of course. Well, okay, there are lots of problems, but I have learned a lot by you, Ian Hatton. Thank you very much for your talk. And um, thank you very much also for the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences in Leipzig to coordinate this global research to tell us about the global patterns in the ocean. We are going to continue this series of lectures on humans and Earth in times of climate change. And on April the 27th, you will listen to a lecture on what is happening in the thawing Siberian soils and what this means to us, to humanity. You will find all the data, uh, all the details on the website of the Max Planck Gesellschaft. It's www 
www.mpg.de and then you scroll down to Veranstaltungen. The next one is going to be in German again. And we will also continue these lectures with further discussions on the humanity, also that also involve the humanities and the perspective of social scientists. So we will continue to to try to find out what it means talking about fragile ecosystems with us humans that have made them so fragile. Please also check the YouTube channel of the Max Planck Gesellschaft and you will find all the preceding lectures and discussions and um, well, I'm looking forward to see you again and again. Ian Hatton, thank you very much.